Cool. Well, uh, welcome to uh, week three of the You and I Together series. Um, I will be your speaker today. Um, we are talking this week about how do bees make honey? I'm Brad Stokes. I'm the U of I Extension Educator in Elmore County. Uh, my helper today is Rebecca Mills. Uh, Rebecca, would you mind introducing yourself really quickly? Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Mills and I'm the Extension Educator in Jim and Boise County. So I am sitting in Emmett, Idaho today. It's a beautiful day. I will be teaching in a few weeks and I'm happy to be here to answer your questions in the chat or address them at the end. And welcome to the series. Um, I wanted to put a plug in for the U of I Extension System and what we do. Um, we bring the knowledge and research of the university to the people of Idaho for a better future of Idaho. And our next slide, we're gonna have a short little video on part of U of I, of U of I Extension. University of Idaho Extension is helping Idahoans care for private and public lands through education to landowners, natural resource managers, and forest industries. From forest insects and diseases, to wildland fire, stream protection, rangeland conservation, and logger education, UI Extension is guaranteeing the sustainability of our land for the future. So that's a little uh, intro into part of what U of I Extension does. Um, for myself, I'm the U of I educator for Elmore County. My focuses are very broad. Um, and focused all at one time. I uh, cover rural and urban agriculture here in Elmore County. Um, I run a master gardener program which fulfills my horticulture appointment. And I also oversee the 4-H positive youth development uh, program here in Elmore County. I'm an expert in insect and arthropod identification. Um, a few pictures I put in here. Top left, I'm actually scoring our shooting sports here in Elmore County. Um, bottom left, this is a wheat field. I was sweeping for some invasive aphids. Uh, this corn photo, um, attending a corn silage harvest for a local grower. Um, this one with me and the hat and the cow here. Um, I got suckered into showing beef for the first time, I believe two years ago for 4-H. Um, bottom right was my master gardener program, planting flowers for the mountain home community. And then top right, uh, this is me and my former program assistant after mountain home became a monarch city participant. So that's a little highlight slide about me. And then we're gonna get straight into bees. I have about 13 or 14 slides and then we'll do a really quick hands-on activity and then I will take any questions you might have. So first of all, I like to talk about the economic value of bees and pollinators, um, the bee economy, if you will. So um, one of the first questions I ever ask is, what do you believe the honeybee value is in the US? And this is just for the pollination services only. That's it. Um, and the number is quite shocking. It's 24 plus or minus billion dollars a year to our local or our national economy, which is amazing. And then I like to put a value on our native and wild bees in the US. And these are the ones that are out pollinating uh, wildflowers, rare species of plants, um, the ground nesting bees that are all over the place. And I put a value of this on about $4 billion a year or more depending on if you like certain wildflower species or not. So that's just something to consider as we move forward. Uh, the total pollinator value of the world, um, it would be pretty much impossible to put a single number on it, but we're talking anywhere from 235 to a little less than $600 billion a year. And that's for all the crops, all the fruits, veggies, um, the chocolate that we eat, everything like that. Um, we're gonna focus a little bit on the actual honeybee, okay? 
Um, the honeybee is in the order Hymenoptera. So this is grouped with the ants, the bees, and the wasps. Um, the honeybee, the species name is Apis mellifera, and it is the European honeybee. Uh, the ones you might see in and around Idaho with the white boxes, the high boxes. Um, these are eusocial insects, so they have um, a caste system. Um, the females, you have the queens and the workers. The queens are the egg-laying individuals, and the workers are the foragers, so they're out foraging for nectar to turn into honey eventually. Uh, the males of this system, they're just the drones and they're there just for reproduction only. Uh, the mouth parts of the bee are very specialized um, for gathering nectar and turning that nectar eventually into honey. And we'll get a little deeper into the mouth parts. So this is the caste system. On the left, you have the average worker. This is the bee that you will see out foraging in your garden, your backyard, um, just medium-sized bee. In the center there, you have the queen and she is full of eggs. So that's why she's a little bit bigger and it has a little bit extended abdomen there. And then on the right, you have the male or the drone bee, uh, a little bit bigger eyes. And um, that's what the caste system looks like for the honeybee. Um, the life cycle of this organism or insect is its holometabolus. Um, it has four life stages, um, starting with an egg that hatches into a larva, and then eventually into a pupa, and then they hatch out as adults. You have one queen per colony in a honeybee system. Um, bees in general can be solitary bees. They can be social or they can be eusocial like the honeybee. The larvae are fed by the worker bees. Those are the ones that are out foraging. Um, honeybee queens, they can live for two or more years. Uh, typically after about year four, you have to requeen. And the workers live anywhere from five to six weeks, sometimes in the middle of summer, maybe even less, and sometimes longer. And then on the right, you have a little diagram. There's the egg and then the larva, pupa and adult. So that's the life cycle. Um, bee foraging. Um, honeybees are generalists. That's meaning they will feed on anything they can get into and get that nectar from the flower. Um, they can forage up to three miles from the hive. Um, that's round, that's pretty far considering it's a bee. And um, foraging, it depends on the their mouth parts. There are some bees that we consider short-tongued bees. We also have some long-tongued bees as well. Um, one female worker honeybee only creates one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in their entire lifetime. So it takes a long time to get this much honey. Um, and it is species specific, okay? Uh, this right here on the left is a diagram of the honeybee head and then the mouth parts sticking out. And then on the right, you can see the actual mouth parts labeled there. Um, they do have mandibles, these yellow guys right here. And those will be right there on the actual photo. Um, the, interestingly, the labium is the most uh, specialized part of the mouth parts and that's used for bringing up the nectar into the foregut of the bee. So how do bees make honey? Um, one worker bee visits somewhere between 100 to 1,000 flowers per day. So that's quite the activity. Um, nectar is their main objective. Um, pollination is secondary and mutualistic to that plant species. Uh, to produce one pound of honey, a colony must visit around 2 million flowers. And again, they forage up to three, four miles away from their colony. Uh, the nectar, so nectar composition. Uh, nectar in the flower is mainly water. So it's 80% water at the flower. And you have some sucrose, some fructose, some glucose, um, amino acids, vitamins, alkaloids, oils. 
um, and so forth. But what about honey? Uh, the water content of honey and how? So honey is um, very thick, viscous um, liquid, and it's only about 16 to 17% water. So how do you go from 80% water to 16 or 17% water? Um, it's done through a couple processes, um, regurgitation and evaporation, okay? So worker bees take the forage nectar, uh, they take it up into their foregut, there's some enzymatic activity there, and then they will share it with the, their sisters within the hive a couple times. Um, this enzymatic activity in the foregut, or you could call it the crop, um, along with this continual passing back and forth helps concentrate that nectar solution. Um, so after a few passes, it gets more concentrated and then this gooey substance is put into those hexagonal hive cells and it's further concentrated by uh, wing flapping and buzzing within the hive by the sisters. So kind of gross, but kind of cool. Um, I think of uh, honey as delicious. Um, I use it all the time. So that is how honey is basically made by bees. Um, some interesting facts about honey. Um, honey has been found in King Tut's tomb. Um, so that was in Egypt and it was about 3000 years old. Um, it was still good, so it was still edible. Um, the enzymatic process that is occurring in the foregut or the crop of the bee um, helps oxidize this honey via glucose, okay? And then the pH of honey is somewhere between three and four and a half. So it's very acidic. Um, interestingly, also local honey can help those with allergies. So if you're having um, allergies from pollen, that's coming from a ways away, maybe a little bit of honey might help you. Some small doses from your local area will contain some pollen from that. Um, honey contains gluconic acid and weirdly enough, a little bit of hydrogen peroxide. So the Sumerians and ancient humans basically used honey for healing, putting it on cuts, um, helping heal the body and protecting those wounds while it healed. Um, how can we help save our bees? Um, I like to look, put in a little plug for this. Um, conservation, um, planting some of our endangered plants or flowers, especially those plants or flowers that bloom or are considered angiosperms is really, really, really critical. Um, we need to protect those. We also need to be planting more of our native plant species. So protecting those plant species and the proliferation of those plant species across Idaho lands is very key. Um, we can do this with seeds or transplants. Um, reducing pesticide impacts and or neonicotinoid uses where applicable. <clears throat> There's been uh, numerous scientific studies on the impact of pesticides on honeybees and our native bees. Um, we also know that neonicotinoids are especially dangerous because they are translocated within the plant itself. Um, so that is something to be aware of. We need to be aware of water ecosystems and the availability of water for our bees. Just like every uh, natural organism on earth, bees need water too. They need water to thrive, to survive, and to basically live. Um, we need to also be aware of pollinator refuge sites and the locations of their nests. So this uh, picture on the right, um, it's interesting to note that basically 70% of our native bee species are nesting within the soil or the ground. So be aware of these little holes in the ground that you might see. Um, there's probably a highly beneficial queen or solitary bee using these areas. 
to nest and create more bees. Um, I'm also highly surprised at the amount of soil sterilant that I see put on the ground. So be aware of that if you're gonna put down some sterilant. Um, be aware of other pollinator species that are present in the area. Um, this includes flies, beetles, butterflies, moths, um, all sorts of insects. Most of them are probably beneficial. And then uh, spreading the word to your community through the newspaper, Facebook, Instagram, and then word of mouth. So that's some ways that we can help preserve our bees. And then um, this is the hands-on activity. I'll stop sharing my screen in a minute. Um, I believe in the supply list, I put a paper plate, some warm water, and uh, a couple tablespoons of honey. So you don't need too much. Um, you can use a regular plate. I'm gonna use a paper plate just because I don't wanna do dishes within the office. So I'll stop sharing for a minute and then um, tilt my camera down and do this quick activity with you. So here's how we're gonna do it, okay? There's my plate. If you have a plate, um, feel free to get it ready. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pour a tablespoon or two, maybe two tablespoons of honey right in the center. You see that? Okay, when you're all ready, let me know. I see uh, Kathy there, is doing something. Hopefully Serene's got hers going. So just right in the center. And then what I'm gonna do is we're gonna take a little bit of just warm water, okay? This is just room temperature water. And I'm just gonna put it right over the top, just a little bit. Now I found this on the internet and I think it's a cool, um, I don't know if you wanna call it a trick or what, but I'm just gonna start shaking the plate in centrifugal motions, circular motions. And we're gonna see if this works. I've tested this before, but you never know when you do it live. So it's happening. You might see it turn, um, a little interestingly, and I'll get my camera close when we're done. So, do you see it? Did I tilt the wrong way? So interestingly, honey will take on the hexagonal shape of the uh, hive there. Okay. Does, can you see that? Probably didn't work. Well, it worked for me, but I do have a, here we go. Here's what should happen if you do it correctly. And I believe I did. Um, on the left is a photo I took the other day of exactly how I did it just now. But um, honey has a memory. So it's kind of one of those um, chemicals or substances that has a memory. And it takes on the shape of the honeycombs. So you can kind of see it in this photo here. These are kind of hexagonal shaped um, things with the honey and the water. I was kind of curious if I was gonna check the chat, see if it's working. Serene says, that's pretty cool. Uh, Rebecca says, whoa, did it work for you, Rebecca? It works for me. I just have to get the camera really up close and it doesn't focus, but it's pretty neat. So, um, that was my quick talk on how bees take honey. And I know um, we want everyone to provide feedback, um, take the evaluation, let us know how we're doing. We take these things seriously with U of I Extension. And um, with that, I would take any questions. Mm -hmm.